<laughs> All right, so let's get started. Um, so I have uh, graded homeworks over here. So homework number one, if you turned it in by hand, it's over here. So come pick it up after class. Um, the rest of you who submitted it through Dropbox uh, on the D2L uh, page should have it already returned, I think, right? Did you guys check your folders? Did you see? Okay, you should have it returned. Uh, if not today, it's hopefully soon. Uh, because they're all graded, so the grade should have been entered. So the grade scale <coughs> is very simple for this course. It's check plus, check minus, check. So that's it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, very minimal because there's 70 people. We can't grade everyone in super detail, but there are uh, standard, a very good job with trying to provide detailed comments on this. So uh, this particular assignment was fully graded. Uh, in the future, they may, that may not be the case uh, because the problems will get a little bit more complicated, but please have a look. Uh, please note any of the comments that Stan made for you. There are some common errors, which I will post along with the solutions on Thursday, okay? So once uh, we collect the, uh, the remaining assignment, okay? So I'll, actually, I'll try to post the solutions to this uh, today uh, or tomorrow night uh, once I make sure everyone has actually turned it in and has gotten graded, but uh, those should be posted fairly soon. So have a look at these, and if you have any questions, come ask me or email Stan or myself, okay? So that's that. Uh, note that there were some typos on uh, homework two, which I sent out emails about, and office hours again today, 4.30 to 5.30 in EC 175, and please start reading uh, towards the end of Brown and Huang chapters 1.10 and 1.12, okay? So we're starting to move into continuous probability distributions and doing more sophisticated things, so please read ahead so you can keep up with the lectures. All right, any logistical questions before we move on? All right, so it's continuing. Uh, from last time, we started talking about random variables. Uh, we discussed discrete and continuous random variables, and we talked about how you could otherwise think of these as just random quantities, right? Random variable is just a fancy mathematical name for something that you measure for a random outcome or a random event. So you could pick a person in this room at random and that is an outcome of an experiment, which is me walking around and pointing my finger at somebody and I measure them. I count how many hairs are on their head or I measure their length and weight or whatever. And those are either discrete or continuous random quantities, right? They're uh, not deterministic. They're things that vary with some statistical distribution or probability distribution. So then we went into how we can quantify probability for random variables. So we talked about probability mass functions and we talked about some examples. And then we started talking about probability density functions for continuous random variables. So we gave the example of spinning the wheel uh, or spinning the arrow on a wheel and which angle would it land on. And we couldn't talk about probabilities for any particular outcome because there's a continuum of outcomes, there's an infinite number of outcomes. And so any particular outcome on a continuum has a probability of zero of occurring, but if we add up all zeros along the real line, we just get zero back, which is not equal to one. So we have to define something else, which is called a density function, which allows us to talk about probabilities on a continuum. And so the events that make sense for a continuous random variable are of what type? What kind of events did we define for probabilities on a continuum or a set of continuous random variables? What's the event definition? Length or intervals, right? So here events equal lengths, lengths and intervals, right? So we have to actually integrate over lengths and integrals and sum up over those and that's how we can get probabilities on a continuum. Then we started to rush through a little bit. We introduced the idea of expectation operators and expected values. So we're gonna spend a little bit more time on that today, going through some examples of how you use that and how you actually compute those and what those actually mean. But let's step back for a second to the probability density function because I rushed through this example a bit last time uh, in order to get to expectations, but I think it's worth spending a little bit more time with this idea of how you use density functions and what they really mean, especially if you've never seen it before. So. Here's a spinning wheel example. So again, if the spinning wheel is fairly constructed, or the arrow on the wheel is fairly constructed, we know that this theta should have something like a uniform density function. That is the probability of obtaining any interval on theta has an equal likelihood. So we can integrate this as a function of theta, and we can obtain something called the 
cumulative distribution function, which tells me how much probability mass each value of theta is sitting on top of. And if I integrate over the entire interval from negative infinity to infinity, if I don't care about wrapping issues, if I only care about probabilities inside 0 to 2 pi, I should get that this entire thing integrates to 1, which in fact it does. So we defined for this particular PDF, we came up with a special function for this. We had P of theta, and we said that this is equal to 1 over 2 pi times something called the indicator function. So it takes on a value of 1 when this argument is true, and it's 0 otherwise, right? So it's a piecewise defined function. It turns on when theta is somewhere in this range, and it turns off when theta is outside that range. And I put 1 over 2 pi to normalize it. So when I take the integral over this entire thing, negative infinity to infinity, all I really have to do is integrate over 0 to 2 pi. Well, the integral of 1 over 0 to 2 pi is going to be 2 pi. 2 pi divided by 2 pi is 1. Therefore, this thing is a proper density function, OK? So how do I actually use this thing? What's the point? So remember, we said that this thing tells us what probabilities are over intervals. So if I ask what's the probability that theta will land in this first quadrant of the circle, I can use the density function to tell me what that is, right? So intuitively, what's the answer? We already know what the answer is intuitively. What is the answer? One by four, right? So hopefully, if I integrate this thing, I should get a quarter, right? So how do I integrate this function to get a quarter? So let's ask the question for formality's sake. What is the probability that theta will be between 0 and pi over 2, right? So pi over 2 is up here. So in that case, we have that we can compute this using the definition of what the density function should allow us to do. So we set the limits of our integral, so of our intervals. So we put the lower limit in the lower limit of the integral, the upper limit of this interval, and the upper limit of the integral. And then we take integral of p theta d theta. So p theta is this. So if I just plug in my definition for p of theta, I have this weird looking function I have to integrate. So times the indicator function between 0 theta 2 pi d theta. OK. Now, here's where I can get a little bit sneaky. I can say, well, the indicator function tells me that it's 1 only inside it's true, and it's 1 only if theta is between 0 and pi over 2, and it's 0 otherwise. So I know I could split up this integral into three parts. So let me do that. So this is equal to, and I can take out the 1 over 2 pi, by the way. So this is equal to the integral from negative infinity Oh, excuse me, I'm jumping ahead of myself. This is integral over 0 to pi over 2 of 1 over 2 pi times this thing. All I really care about is this interval over here. Uh, I'm just jumping ahead to the next example. So pi over 2 is somewhere over there. So my indicator function is definitely containing that interval 0 to pi over 2. And I know that my indicator function is just the value 1 between 0 and pi over 2. So I can rewrite this integral as 0 pi over 2 1 over 2 pi times 1 d theta, because indicator function 1 of this is 1 on 0 to pi over 2 interval. OK, don't need to do anything too fancy here. So this is the integral I end up calculating. So that's just equal to course, 1 over 2 pi times pi over 2. And lo and behold, that's in fact the answer I get, that this is the probability that theta is between 0 and pi over 2, just as our intuition suggested. OK? So any questions about how I did this thing with the indicator function? Anyone confused about what I just did over here in this step, going from here to here? OK, so what I, so again, I kind of muddled the explanation before. So the indicator function, again, literally looks like 0 over here take, turns on to 1 times whatever that is, all the way up to here, then it drops back down to 0. So I'm saying all I want to do with this probability calculation, all I want to do is integrate between 0 and pi over 2. I want to integrate this function between 0 and pi over 2. So all I care about is this shaded region over here. Okay. 
That's all I need. So I don't really care that the function turns off over here. I just know that it stays on for that long as long as I'm inside zero to pi over two. So this function effectively is just the same as one times one over two pi inside that interval, okay? And then I'm just done, all right? All right, let's ask a slightly, slightly easy, uh, well, less obvious question, but not so much less obvious. What is the probability that data is not only between zero and pi over two, but also could be between pi and three pi over two? All right, so in this case, <laughs> Now I'm asking for this question in red, what's the probability that the arrow lands somewhere in those two regions? So what do I do here? So which probabilities am I gonna add, right? So I'm gonna compute this probability, which I already did, right, so that's a quarter, and then I have to figure out what that probability is and add it to that one. Why can't I just add them? They're disjoint, right? So they're not adding up in any meaningful way, they don't overlap, so in this case, the probability of this interval plus the probability of this interval gives me the probability that it lands in either interval. And of course, intuitively, what should the answer be? One half, right? So hopefully, again, my density function will save me and tell me that that other interval also has a probability of one quarter. So this is the same as probability just for this plus probability that because intervals are disjoint. Okay, so now I have to compute this second probability where the probability for beta being between pi, three pi over two, it's pretty much exactly the same thing except now I have different limits for my integral, okay? But I have exactly the same function that I'm integrating as before so I, I won't write out the full condition for the indicator function, which is equal to that. Once again, now I'm looking at this interval. Uh, let's see, so that's somewhere, uh, it's not half, but so somewhere between halfway into this thing and three quarters of the way is this other interval that I care about. Okay, so here's pi and here's three pi over two. So now I want to integrate that region so uh, once again, the indicator function tells me that that function is just one between the red boundaries. So once again, I can simply write that this is equal to the integral between pi, three pi over two, one over two pi times one, d theta, and lo and behold, I get one over two pi times pi over two, which is the same as one quarter. So therefore, this whole thing must be equal to a quarter, which I computed above, plus one quarter, which I computed on the side, which is equal to a half, right? And that's the probability that it's inside that interval, okay? Which agrees with my intuition. So that's what density functions let me do. They let me just pick arbitrary intervals to look at, and then I can just stick them into the top and bottom of this thing and then pop out the probability that it's inside, okay? So what happens if I shrink this interval in? What if I bring this right-hand thing closer and closer to pi? What should happen to that second probability that I computed? Go to, should go to zero, right? So in the limit, as I take this upper thing and take it from three pi over two back towards pi, I'm taking thinner and thinner and thinner slices until I'm left with infinitesimally nothing, and then I'm back to zero, right? So then if I, ask what's the probability that theta is between zero and pi over two or is equal to pi, right? It's exactly the same as saying, well, add one quarter to zero and that will just give me a quarter, right? So in the limit, as this thing shrinks, this thing, the slice will get thinner and thinner and thinner and the probability density function is giving me less and less probability mass under there, okay? And you can prove to yourselves, I won't do it here, that the integral over this whole thing is in fact equal to one, so if I add up the integral of the remaining intervals, right, that will also equal a half, and this whole thing should equal to one, okay? So that's an exercise for you to do, so it's a proper PDF, okay? So that's how you use probability density functions, generally speaking, all right, when you're trying to compute probabilities. All right, so continuing on our dive into density functions and continuous random variables, let's talk a little bit more about 
expectation operators and expected values and do a couple of examples to show you why these things can be kind of useful and how you actually go about chugging through some numbers. And then we'll start talking about the univariate normal Gaussian PDF, which is one of the very important subjects in this class because a lot of estimation theory is built on top of this assumption that your random variables obey or have a normal distribution. And we'll talk about some of the features of that. Um, we'll look at some pictures and stare at some plots of Gaussians, which you probably have seen before. But let's talk about expectations and expected values first. So, uh, so last time we kind of rushed through this a little bit. So this is the end of last time's notes, so you don't necessarily have to rewrite this if you don't want to. This stuff, again, I wrote out in hand. I'm just kind of leaving it up here to show, uh, but you know, just maybe listen a little bit more than write if you have to on this slide. So again, uh, what do we care about? Expected values and things like that. So when we have random variables, we can quantify random events and what happens in an outcome of a random experiment, but we don't just want to stop there. We want to do something and operate on those outcomes. So if we take a function of a random variable, again, not surprisingly, that function y equal to g of x it will also be a random variable. Now there are two kind of situations we're gonna consider. Uh, generally speaking, in the first case, we could try to find the distribution of what y will look like. So if I know what the distribution of x is, I could theoretically compute what the probability distribution of the random variable y will look like. But this is actually kind of hard, which is why we're not gonna talk about it first. We're gonna talk about that next week, how you actually do that. And oftentimes you don't actually need the full distribution. Okay, you just need a single value that summarizes what you should typically expect. What that means is if I were to run random experiments plucking out values from x, taking samples of x and sticking them into the function y, I would like to know the average or long-term typical result that I would expect without having to get all the possible values for y that could show up, right, if I knew the full distribution of y, right? So really the idea of expected values and expectations is what is the average value of some arbitrary function whose input is a random variable, okay? So we talked about two, dis two different cases. There's the discrete case, and I didn't tell you why we defined it this way, but I'm gonna do that in a second, okay? But here's the definitions that you need to know. For a discrete case, we take the expected value of g of x, we write an e and a bracket in front of it, we say the expected value of this function, which is a deterministic function, by the way, but it has a random input now, is basically the sum over all possible values that I could get from x, there are nx different values. If I plug each of them in and multiply the value of g that comes out by the probability of what came in, that will give me one piece of the sum and then I keep doing that for all of that and I get something called the expected value. The result is a single number in this case, okay? So just, just keep that in mind, equal single number, right? Some constant with respect to x. Okay, likewise here, if I look at it for a continuous random variable, if I think of the integral as a Riemann sum, it's this infinite sum of little probability intervals that I'm taking inside here, I multiply by the density function times dx for all possible intervals, and I just, again, multiply by the output that I get, I should also get the same thing for the continuous case, right? So once again, this is also going to be some single number, which is constant with respect to x, okay? So this E thing is called the expectation operator. It shows up in a lot of different places. And basically it returns the expected value of g, okay? which is the argument, which is that dot that I put over here, okay? So that's what the E is called. So why don't I define it this way? What's the big deal of writing it out and this seems kind of arbitrary. I'm just taking a function, multiplying it by a probability and summing it up and what am I, what am I getting out of it? Yeah? Um, what is the bar to the left of the expectation, like the E and the expectation operator? Because it's not in your definitions up top. Um, which, but when you wrote it down below. Which bar are you talking about? The uh, red. It's like IE. This, oh. yeah, right this? Uh, the far left of that line. 
far left. No, 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 no. The right, right next to the E. Oh, yeah. you know the fancy, <laughs> the fancy looking E. The fancy looking E. This thing? Yeah. 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 This is the E. No, this is, okay, so that is the bold E. <laughs> so sometimes I'll write this as a bold E. <laughs> but if I write this, this is just a double bar for an E, right? So that's like a bold E. So if you've ever seen the real you know, the set of real numbers and integers and things like that, I'm just adding an extra bar to that thing. That just is like a bold script, okay? Yeah, sometimes I'll lose track and I, I won't write it. Sometimes I will write it, but that's just the, that's just the script thing or capital letters, okay? So go back to my question, why did I define it this way, right? What's the significance of multiplying probabilities by the function This seems totally arbitrary, okay? So let's go back to when we started talking about what is a probability, okay? <coughs> let's think about the relative frequency view of probabilities for, in this case, let's just focus on discrete random variables for the time being, but equally applies to continuous ones. <coughs> Remember how we defined uh, probability in the relative frequency sense, right? We said that the probability of an event i is equal to the limit n goes to infinity of the number of times I would see the event i out of n possible experimental trials, right? So this is telling me that the probability of some random variable for event i, so let's say random variable x sub i for event i, okay? where i is equal to one for mx is given by ni occurrences, or sorry, given ni occurrences in n trials. So in other words, if I run n trials and I see ni occurrences of xi in those n trials, I can assign that to be the probability of event i as long as I take an infinite number of those experiments. As long as n goes to infinity, then in some limit, this thing should be defined, okay? So that's one way to think about the probability. So this is a very informal kind of justification of expected values, but the idea is that if I kind of invert this definition a little bit, if I then ask, what is the expected number of times I should see n i given a very large number of trials, how could I solve for n i? if I know the probability of i. It's a trick question, but it's really easy. What do I do? How do I get n i back out from this formula? Just multiply by n on both sides, right? So n times p i gives me the expected number of times I should see n i, right? So the number of times I typically expect to see, the keyword is typically, the number of times be typically <coughs> expect to see uh, xi in n trials as n goes to infinity, therefore we have for n1, we have that this is equal to p1 times big N and two, we should be P2 times big N, and so on and so forth for N sub NX equal to P N sub NX, or P sub NX times N, okay? So this is the expected number of times I expect to see each of those events given just N trials. It doesn't mean that I will exactly see those events that many times, it's just how often I expect to see them given a probability, okay? That doesn't mean that, that if I start flipping coins, I should exactly see that many heads and that many tails. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that's the expected value or the expectation or the sample mean that I would expect to get for that uh, number of events. So if I imagine <coughs> running an experiment n times and there are n sub x possible outcomes with probability pi associated for each of those, I could look at the x i's that I collect and you take the sample average of those random variables that I've seen in n trials, okay? So I'm gonna define the sample average, x bar sample, and I'm gonna deliberately write the sample here, x bar sample. The sample average, given n1, n2, n sub nx, et cetera, would be n1 times x1. So the number of times I saw 
event one times the random variable x1 plus n2 times x2 plus so on and so forth, n sub nx times x sub nx divided by n. Okay, so this is the sample average or sample, typical sample average, I should say, that you would see. Sample mean or sample average. Right, so what happens then if I let n go to infinity? Okay, so this is for a finite n. So if I were to, in fact, run just n, say, 10 trials, n sub 1 plus n sub 2 plus n sub nx should add up to 10, right? So now what if I just let n go to infinity? Well, if n goes to infinity, I can use this result up here based on this definition of the probability, right? So I can say, well, in the limit, as n goes to infinity, I can replace this n1 by p1n, n2 by p2n, and so on and so forth, okay? So I'm going to do that. So as n goes to infinity, I'm going to get instead, I'm going to replace each of these n terms with p1 times n times x1 plus p2 times n times x2, so on and so forth, plus p sub n x times n times x sub n x. And then I'm going to divide everything by n, okay? But if n is already everywhere and in the limit as n goes to infinity, essentially these n's disappear. So what I should get is just p1 times x1 plus p2 times x2 plus so on and so forth, pnx times x sub nx, which is exactly my definition for what I defined to be my expected value on the previous slide. Okay, in this case it's pi times xi which is just the expected value. I'll drop the second bar, not to confuse anybody. Right, so here we go. So here we go, so the point is, is that in these, in these formulas, there's no dependence on n anymore, okay? I've gotten rid of the n because now I have the probability which virtually allows me to say I could run in theoretically an infinite number of experiments and the probability encodes what the typical result or typical sample average would be the limit as n goes to infinity. So the main idea here is that the expected value is a conceptual average obtained over an infinite number of trials n, okay? So this is how you can think about it. The expected value that comes out, the result that comes out of E, this E operator, is a conceptual average obtained over an infinite number of trials n. The idea is you don't actually have to run an infinite number of trials if we already know the probability of the outcomes, right? We already know this. So we know theoretically what would happen if I were to compute a sample mean for a very large number of trials. It would just be related to the probability of obtaining those events, okay? Now, I'm gonna stress something important here, which is that the expected value is what you, again, this sounds like a circular definition, expectancy is what you would see in a typical random trial. It's not what you would actually see in any given trial. Because every trial is random, it's impossible to know what will actually happen in any, any given trial. But a typical trial that has this distribution would produce such a sample result, okay? So now there are two other caveats here. The expected value is not the same as a sample average or a sample mean for a finite n. So if I take a certain trial and I do a certain number of experiments and I take a sample average, say n is equal to 10, 100, 15, 20, what I get for the expected value does not tell me what this will exactly be equal to, right? I take the average temperature in this room, I should say it's whatever, 70 degrees. If I take it moment to moment at any given time, it's not gonna exactly read 70 degrees if I average it over any arbitrary interval. It'll be 70 point something, 69 point something, 68 point something, 71 point something, whatever, okay? It'll be fluctuating around the mean, but it won't be equal to the mean, it won't be equal to the expected value, okay? The second thing is, this tells you again nothing, and I say it again, expected value tells you nothing about the actual number you would obtain for a finite n. So if I do n trials and then I ask what's n plus one gonna give me, there's no such thing as the law of averages that says, oh well, you always have to obtain the average, therefore whatever the result is has to bring you back down to the average, right? That's the so-called law of averages. It's complete garbage. There's no such thing as the law of averages. 
you ever hear anyone telling you about the law of averages, shoot them down immediately because it's wrong. There's no such thing as a law of averages because what the law of averages says is that, well, if I keep playing, I'll get lucky and you know, things should break my way. You're not entitled to win, unfortunately. The universe will possibly, there's a non-zero probability you could keep losing if you keep gambling, right? You, will, you could just lose all your money, you will always lose. There's no way that anything about expected value tells you that the next trial you get will then bring you back to the average, right? It doesn't, doesn't work that way. That's not how probability works because trials are inherently random. You can't know anything about what the future will actually hold. All you could do is predict the asymptotic average that you typically would get under that probability distribution. But once again, any particular sample average will, with probability one, not exactly equal to that for a finite n, right? And the limit as n goes to infinity, there's something called the law of large numbers which is a bastardization, which is bastardized to give you the law of averages, right? That's basically what happened there. Um, the law of, law of large numbers says in the limit as n goes to infinity, averages and samples and things like that converge to their expected values, okay? But you can't turn that around and then say, well, because of that, there's this thing called the law of averages. That means if I keep playing, then you know, things will break my way eventually, right? It doesn't work that way, okay? So those are just two things to keep in mind because that's, a, that's a, a common misconception about what expected values mean. All they mean is, conceptually, if I ran this experiment for a really large number of n, I could compute what the average would be without even knowing what n is because I have the probabilities to tell me what that should typically look like, okay? So we'll do a couple of examples, hopefully, uh, in a second to show you what that really amounts to, okay? But, so that doesn't seem particularly useful but it's useful for a couple of different reasons. So when you design things like the Kalman filter, the reason you tune gains in a Kalman filter is to minimize what's called the mean squared error. It's the average error, how often the Kalman filter will be wrong on average in a typical run when you put data into it, okay? So that, what that means is the Kalman filter can't always be right. It can't know exactly what the state is. Sometimes it's gonna be wrong, right? But the goal is to minimize how often it's wrong. So the expected value of how wrong it is should be as small as possible, right? So sometimes it'll be way wrong and sometimes it'll be way right and those things on average will even out. Hopefully they won't be so extreme and weird, but with expected value you can analyze that behavior and then tune your filter accordingly so you don't bring down you know, your spacecraft or aircraft while you're testing it in the loop. You can just do it analytically and prove that that gain is the best possible gain you can find, okay? Well, so we'll get into that in a second. So what are some common and expect, important expected values? So I, I you know, threw out a bunch of them last time, so we'll just go through some of those again in a little bit more slowly and talk about them. Uh, so, so these are the really important ones that we're gonna talk about in the class. So uh, the moments of a probability distribution, so some of you have already heard of some of these, but we'll formally define and compute some of these for other kinds of distributions. So the one that we always will talk about a lot is the mean or average of a random variable, x, okay? So sometimes this is also known as the first moment. Okay, so this is just defined as the expected value. Here I go again with the double bar. Sorry, I'm gonna break that habit one day. So we denote that as expected value of x or sometimes we just write it as x with a bar over it. That's a shorthand. So I'll write this for both the continuous and discrete case so we can see it side by side. So for the continuous case, which is the one we're gonna be using most in this class, I just stick in x as my function g, I put it there and multiply it by the probability density, integrate it between all the bounds, dx, and that's my expected value. And if I'm in discrete land, I just take a sum, I equal to nx, where nx could be infinite, right? We had talked about Poisson distributions and things like that. X, probability that of x here for discrete random variables, okay? And that's just the average result. So that's what we talked about on the previous slide, right? So this is what a sample average typically would look like. If I were to simulate, draw samples, let's say, from p of x, and then the average value of x's that I drew, x bar in the limit as n goes to infinity should be what those values converge to, okay? So the next thing we talk about is the second moment. Okay, so the second moment of x is called expected value x squared. It doesn't get a fancy symbol, okay, but it shows up in a second. That's just the integral of the x squared 
dx dx, and then that's again a continuous land. The discrete land, it's sum from i equals one through the number of values for x, x squared, infinity of x, okay? So all I did literally was plug in the function x squared now, and then I integrated and computed the expected value. What that means literally in terms of samples and things like that, I took a sample from p of x, I computed the function x squared, and now I'm adding up all the realizations of x squared that I got and taking a sample average in the limit, it then goes to infinity, this is the value I should obtain, right, for x squared. That's all it means, all right? And then with those first two, we can define, those first two moments, we can define something called, of course, the variance, some the second moments about the mean, if you still live in the 1900s, early 1900s. So this gets the symbol var x, sometimes also denoted sigma squared x, or sometimes just sigma squared, okay? And it's defined as the expected value of x minus the mean squared, quantity squared, okay? And this is equal to, again, for continuous, once again, all we're doing, you can see the pattern here, mechanically just plugging in the function and taking the integral or plugging in the function and taking the sum with respect to the probabilities. Okay, that's all that is. And of course, we can define higher order moments. Okay, so generally speaking, uh, we, can def we can generally define the expected value of x to the n, okay, which again, not a surprise, is just gonna be, is just gonna be the integral of x to the n, p of x dx. And then we have, of course, x to the n, capital P of x, proper probability, and x like that, okay? And all this is doing just sticking in x to the n, this is giving us shape information about the PDF. So when we go from the mean, that tells us where the center of mass of the probability distribution is, right? Where most of the probability distribution tends to concentrate. Okay, so that's what this first moment tells us, kind of like the centroid, right? For those of you who are Mechies or structures people, right? Remember that. The second moment tells us how much, dis how dispersed the probability mass is inside a particular distribution, so how spread out it tends to be. The variance also tells us, but it just tells us that about the mean, right? So this is centering everything about the centroid. This is just telling us how spread out it is over the entire uh, support or interval of the probability distribution. Higher order moments give us other shape information. So there are things like skewness and kurtosis and excess kurtosis and things like that. So these tell us about of distribution function. So for example, and you can go on Wikipedia if you like to look these up, skewness, kurtosis, et cetera. So if you're into hardcore statistics, these are things that you would look at. Skewness tells you how non-symmetric a probability distribution is. So you look at the third moment, and then kurtosis has to do with how flat or curvy a probability distribution is, okay? So that's the f related to the fourth moment, and then there are other moments, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, you can go all the way up if you want. And back in the early days of statistics and probability, this was a big deal, because this is how people used to fit probability distributions to data. They used to do something called moment matching, right? They used to see where the tails of the probability distribution were, then they picked a curve that would match those moments, essentially, right? That would match the sample averages all the way out. Questions? squared on the x minus x bar on oh, the yes. variance side. Yes, we should just square it. Thank you. Right, okay. And then from this, by the way, I skipped this too. So we can also define the standard deviation, of course. Call it the standard deviation of x or just sigma of x or sometimes just sigma. And this is simply just the square root of the variance of x. Okay, so sometimes you see that as well. And so we mainly do that just to get this in the same units, right? So let's think about the units. 
the units of the mean are exactly the same as x. The units of the second moment and the variance are in units of x squared. Okay, the standard deviation is in the units of x and the higher order moments are whatever units they have to be in for the powers of n, okay? And one last thing we can talk about in terms of useful moments and things of that nature. So I won't give any uh, example on this slide, but we'll talk about it in a second. We can think about the expected reward or cost function j of x for a particular experiment. So you could be gambling and you could be asking yourself how much money do I expect to make on this slot machine or roulette table or whatever. Or you could be doing optimal control with a stochastic system and then you want to minimize some performance index, tells you how much bumpiness your aircraft is feeling in the passenger cabin or something like that. That's related to a cost function you can define, say on your state vector x, but your state vector could be random, so you want to you want to compute what the expected value of that thing will be. Okay, so just generally speaking, we could call it that. And once again, this is simply just an integral of j of x, t of x, dx, or j of x, capital T of x. Okay, so this is useful for things like stochastic optimal control and optimal filter design and all this other stuff. So we're gonna use that expected value in a couple of weeks when we talk about Kalman filtering and how we define performance for a filter, okay? With a certain type of noise distribution defined for it. All right, so these are just definitions that you'll run into very often. Okay, so let's do some examples with these to show what they produce. So let's consider the discrete case first, just to warm up. So go, let's go back to the die example. So you have a standard six-sided die. It's fair, it has probability of one six for all the different faces. And let's suppose you want to compute the expected value for uh, expected face value for a single roll of the die, okay? So I'm just focusing on part A right now. So in this case, we know what that distribution is. We know that we're looking for the expected value, the mean value, right, in this case. So the mean roll. So what am I gonna actually roll in that case? So here, I just take some from i equals one through six, so n sub x is equal to six. My random variable here is uh, going to be, so I'm gonna, oops, use the letter x sub i times p x sub i, where i could be one through six. Okay, so we have one times the probability of x i equal to one, plus two times the probability x i equals to two, and so on and so forth. Six times the probability that x i equals to n, okay? So once I have that, I can plug in the probabilities. I know that each of these probabilities is one six. Two times one six. Six, okay? I can pull out the one six. And what's the sum of all these numbers? What's one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six? 21, very good. So this is equal to that. So that means that my expected value is x bar equals three and a half. Okay, what does that mean? So clearly my die does not have the number three and a half on it, right? Does something go wrong horribly with this calculation? Or does this result make sense? Who thinks it doesn't make sense? Let me ask, okay, why don't you think it makes sense? Because you expect the uh, expected value to be right in the middle. It's like right there. Three and a half on the die. So what were you expecting? What were you guys expecting? You seem to be in agreement. Yeah, so I, I was thinking. Okay, so, so if you think about this, you think why isn't it three or some number that would make sense, right, on the die? It doesn't have to because remember, the, the justification for expected value is if I take a sample average of whatever my random values are, and my random values are just, my random variables are just numbers that I've assigned to outcomes on an experiment. I'm just gonna get some average, some average number that I'm supposed to see, okay? So 
this makes sense mathematically, right? Now, if I'm, if I'm giving this to a control system, right, that has to do some fire a missile based on the result of a die roll or something, right? I don't know. Maybe this number doesn't make a lot of sense to report, right? This doesn't make sense to report a value that doesn't live on the number line, but maybe then I shouldn't be using the expected value in the first place, right? Expected value doesn't always make sense as a thing to report in the context of what you're trying to do, right? This is just an average that you would get in a very large number of experiments of die rolls in the limit, if you just kept taking sample averages of these things, they would end up at three and a half, okay? It wouldn't necessarily be any one of those numbers, all right? Now let's, let's up the stakes, literally. Let's suppose your friend comes up to you and says, I'll give you money or not if you roll a particular number on a die according to some function ri, right? So here's an example of a cost function j of x, okay, that you could compute the expected value for. So let's write a table for what this function looks like. So your friend, if you roll any of these numbers, you will receive $10 for rolling, and here are dollar values, by the way, $10 rolling a three or a four, $5 for rolling a two or a five, and $0 for rolling a one or a six, okay? So what is the expected reward for this game, okay? So this is the expected take or expected value of what you should earn. So this is, again, just the probability, we're just plugging in mechanically here, PI, so this is just equal to the reward if I equals to one times the probability that I equals to one plus the reward times I equals two times the probability that I equals to two, so on and so forth. And if we plug in the numbers, we should get the following. So the reward for one is zero, zero times one six is that number. The reward for two is five times one six is that number. Reward for three is 10 times one six. So 10 times one six plus five times one six plus zero times one six. And then I get, if I collect all the terms, plus two times 10 times one six, and that's equal to 30 over six, which is equal to five bucks. That's how much you should expect on average in a certain number of trials in an infinite number of trials to receive for playing this game, or playing it once, I should say, right? It's not a cumulative sum, but this is the average reward you would get on each roll of the die that you play with your friend, okay? So keep in mind, you can keep playing this game, and you could always roll ones or sixes, right? And if you keep rolling ones and sixes, you can't say, well, the law of averages says I should keep playing because I, I will eventually win, right? You don't know if you'll win, because probability could screw you over. It's just not your lucky day. And you could just keep rolling ones and sixes and actually there's a non-zero probability you will get nothing, right? And that could happen, right? So you shouldn't just trust because the expected reward is five is that you will actually win. Now, the smart thing would be to keep playing because it's likely that you would win, but that doesn't mean you will, you're entitled to win, right? There's a difference between those two statements, okay? So this is just the expected value of what you should expect to get. Kind of agrees with your intuition a little bit if you stare at that long enough. Okay, all right, so let's move on to continuous uh, functions and talk about means and things like that for that. So let's go with an example back to the uniform PDF where we had the spinning wheel problem. Yep. Just quick. Yep, the last one. Clarification, so it almost doesn't make sense to me because <coughs> if you keep playing, you should keep making money. Well, so what I'm saying is this is the expect per roll. Right, if you kept accumulating, that's a different story. So this wouldn't be a very fun game, this wouldn't be a good game for your friend to play with you because they would just be <laughs> giving you money anyway. Right? They never take anything back from you, right? So, yeah. This is obviously not a Las Vegas level game, right, so. Yeah, they'd charge you $6 to play. And right, they'd win. so, exactly. <laughs> okay, so let's go to moments, so. All right, so let's see how we can compute the mean, the moment, and the variance of this spinning wheel problem, right? So remember, we defined our P of theta with this funky looking uniform distribution. So here's a symbol, by the way, for the uniform distribution that you'll see every now and then. I'll write the letter U, and I'll put in brackets the lower bound and then the upper bound for the interval that defines the uniform PDF, okay? And remember that this is just shorthand for normalizing constant, which in this case, is one over two pi times the indicator function, zero less than theta less than two pi, 
okay, which again just says that my function is 1 over 2 pi if data is in the interval 0 to 2 pi and 0 otherwise, okay? So what does intuition tell you the expected value should be, right? So what is the mean equal to theta bar equal to the expected value of theta? What should that be equal to? Pi, right? Because it's right halfway down the middle, nice and clean. Okay, so is that in fact what I get? Well, let's see. So if I do do some math. So I stick in my limits of my integral. I stick in my function for my expectation operator. Now I just wrap up the expectation operator with p of theta d theta. Then I stick in the rest of this function, p of theta d theta. So that's 1 over 2 pi times the indicator function d theta. Okay, so now I'm going to say that this is equal to 1 over 2 pi. I bring that out times the integral from this to this. Theta times the indicator function d theta. Now I can break up the integral. Into convenient parts because I have this indicator function to deal with. Okay, so I have to integrate from negative infinity to infinity. My indicator function tells me that this function is off from negative infinity to zero. It turns on from zero to pi. It turns off again from two pi to infinity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break up this integral from negative infinity to infinity over exactly those bounds. So I'm going to integrate from negative infinity to zero, okay, of theta times the indicator function d theta. And I have the one over two pi here sitting on the outside. <clears throat> Plus the integral from zero to two pi times theta times the indicator function d theta. Plus the integral from two pi to infinity of theta times the indicator function all the way out to d theta, okay. So far, all I've done is just break up this integral, okay, into convenient parts. So I broke up the limits of this one big interval into three small intervals. Now I apply the definition of the indicator function. Which says that if I'm inside the interval zero to two pi, I just, take this thing and multiply it by one. If I'm not inside that interval, if I'm in this interval or this interval, I just get a zero. But if I'm in this interval, I just get a one over two pi, okay? So this should just be one over two pi times integral from negative infinity to zero of zero d theta plus integral zero to two pi theta times one d theta plus the integral from two pi to infinity Zero d theta, of course, is just a zero. Zero, big fat zero. So this is just one over two pi times theta squared two over two two pi, and lo and behold, I do in fact get that theta bar is equal to pi. Reading with my intuition, okay, that's exactly what I should get, right? But similarly, we can do the same thing to find the second moment. So we won't go through all the math necessarily, but I'll show you the key steps. So the expected value for the second moment is just the expected value of theta squared. So now instead of theta in all these integrals, I just replace everything with theta squared. So I just do exactly the same thing. So theta squared, p theta, d theta, okay. And I'm writing out all these steps so that you get used to seeing this and get used to doing it for yourself, especially if you've never done this before. It's very mechanical, kind of repetitive, but not all these integrals look so easy or are exactly the same. We will find out in the next one. So this is what I've got to here once I plug in all the definitions. So as before, break up and use definition of indicator function. Just keep doing that over and over again ad nauseum. So this is one over two pi times the integral from infinity to zero, 
theta plus integrals of two pi theta squared u theta plus two pi to infinity zero u theta this is zero so this is zero this is zero and this is more algebra and this is just going to be equal to expected value of x of theta squared excuse me is going to be two pi squared quantity squared over three, okay? So once again, all I did was the same trick. So I now just stuck in theta squared instead of theta like I did up here, where up here I just broke up this integral over this whole thing and exploited the fact that this function is piecewise defined. So over this piece, I know that that integral is just gonna be zero. Over this piece, that integral is gonna be zero. The only piece I need to really integrate is this piece. That's what I'm left over with and then that just gives me the result I need, okay? And I could do the same thing for theta squared, except now I'm just integrating this function instead of theta, okay? And I end up with that for my second moment, okay? Any questions about this? All right, so far so good. So let's look at the variance. So the variance looks a bit scary. Nothing to be afraid of though, it's just the expected value of theta minus theta bar squared for that, right? Now keep in mind, the trick here is that theta bar is a constant. It's a number, okay? It's a specific number, it's pi. I already computed it the last time. But let's work out what this would look like if I were to write out all the moments. So this is integral from theta theta bar squared to theta d theta, okay? And so this is equal to Integral that to that of theta minus theta bar squared. Again, times one over two pi times my indicator function, theta. Now, instead of breaking up for the indicator function, I'm going to break up this term here, which is this uh, squared term. So I'm gonna use FOIL, of course, go back to eighth grade and apply my knowledge from that here. Okay. So we go here, okay? So now the trick is, before I break this up any further, I'm gonna use the fact that the integral here can be distributed among these terms, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna break up the integral, and so instead what I'm gonna get is one over two pi times the integral from negative infinity to infinity, theta squared times that indicator function d theta, plus, or sorry, uh, minus two theta bar times the integral of theta, indicator function d theta, plus integral negative infinity to infinity of theta bar squared times that. So let me take out the theta bar squared from here, write this integral, this last term as theta bar squared integral negative infinity to infinity of the, the indicator function d theta, okay? So what do I got here? So if I simplify these things, this whole term is equal to the expected value of x squared, which I already computed. This thing, which is from negative infinity to infinity, is just equal to the expected value x, which is, or expected value, excuse me, of theta. I keep writing x, so I should be writing theta, right, which is theta bar. And this thing, what is this last integral equal to? Keep in mind I have the one over two pi out here, so what is this gonna give me? This is gonna give me a one, okay? So this whole thing really is just equal to the expected value squared minus two theta bar squared plus theta bar squared. If I simplify this, it's equal to the expected value of this minus theta bar squared, which is what the variance of theta is equal to, which if I plug in the numbers should be pi squared over three, okay? Using the value from this thing. So this calculation is actually kind of nice because this simplifies 
having to do this integral every single time. So once I have the, sorry, theta bar squared. So once I have the mean theta bar and once I have the second moment expected value theta squared, I know immediately how to compute the variance. It's just the difference between those two things where this thing is squared and that's what I should end up with, which is in fact the variance of that uniform distribution from before, okay? So this whole exercise shows me a couple of things that you should be able to use in any expected value calculation. So this step over here, where I jumped inside and I pulled apart all these terms, follows from a particular property of the expectation operator, which is linearity, right? The expectation operator happens to be a linear operator because the integral is also a linear operator, right? So taking integrals of things gives you a linear operator, linear operation. So when I have the expected value of a sum of things, no matter what it is, if they're scaled by constants and anything else, I can always pull them apart and then compute the expected value of the individual things, okay? And then the second thing is that I can compute the variance this way. So these are two useful facts, properties about expectations. So the first one, again, is the expectation is linear. So the expected value of alpha times f of x plus beta times g of x is equal to alpha times the expected value of f of x plus beta times the expected value of g of x, okay? For any constants, alpha and beta, and any integrable functions, f of x and g of x, okay? And then the other useful fact, which you can always use, is that the variance value, we just showed this on the previous slide, basically, it was the proof. The variance of this guy is always equal to expected value of x squared minus the square value of x. Okay, let's see how that happens over there. Okay, so these are just two useful facts you could always use, and this will greatly simplify your life later on in the course when we're computing and proving that the Kalman filter has such and such expected values, right? You don't wanna sit there. This gets really nasty when these are matrices and these are vectors, right? So you don't want to have to expand out integrals of matrices and vectors. You should just use linearity and use the definition of variance that way, especially when we get the covariance, in order to compute these things much more quickly, okay? So these are useful, handy tools, and they're valid for both continuous and discrete probabilities, okay? So these are always true, no matter how you define the expectation operator, all right? So let's see. Um, so I was gonna do one more example of computing moments and things like that, but um, I think you guys get the general idea from the uniform PDF, so I will skip the one that I was gonna do with the skewed PDF, and what I'll do instead is I'll show you how to do the, what the expected value of functions are, because that's slightly more useful, okay? Uh, maybe I'll post this example for the skewed PDF if uh, people are still confused by the one I did for the uniform PDF, okay? So let me, let me just run through some examples here quickly of expected values for functions. So, so far we've been talking about moments and things like that, but let's talk about, uh, let's go back to the spinning wheel problem for a second. Let's suppose I apply a function to theta. So say sine of theta for the spinning wheel problem, right? So if I give you back the PDF for what that looks like, that's one over two pi, here's P of theta, here's theta, two pi, zero. Okay, it looks like a uniform PDF. If I ask you, what's the average value of the sine function going through that thing, okay, roughly speaking, that's the sine function, right? What would you expect the average value of y equal to sine of theta to be given that theta could be a random variable anywhere between that interval? Zero, okay, so that's intuitive enough, right? So that's easy. So let's actually go ahead and compute what I should get for the expected value of that function, right? And again, the integral comes to the rescue here, okay? So the expectation operator tells me exactly that. So the expected value of sine of theta is simply equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of sine of theta times P of theta D theta, okay, where we've defined again our problem from before as one over two pi times indicator function zero less than theta less than two pi 
data. And once again, I invoke the fact that my indicator function tells me my function turns on only between zero and two pi. It turns off, it goes to zero outside those intervals. So I can restrict the integral to be zero to two pi. Okay, so this is one over two pi integral from zero to two pi of sine of theta times one d theta. And of course that's equal to zero, right? So we know for a fact that this average value should be zero, okay? Not a surprise. Here's a slightly trickier problem, okay? Suppose the probability mass was not uniform. Okay, suppose I gave you a function and I gave you another probability distribution where the probability mass is tilted to one side, right? So how would you then, just by looking at that curve, tell what the average value of the function should be, right? You can't, right? Here's one such example where that's going to be the case, okay? So here's f of x is 2x squared minus 3x plus 1, and p of x is a skewed PDF, which I didn't give you yet because I, didn't, I skipped over example 3, okay? So I'm going to... Uh, Jump back into the machine for just a moment because it's, I lost my pen. Okay, please don't lock me out of, okay. For some reason, it's kicking me out of PowerPoint. That's fine. Try again. Thank you. So the skewed PDF, I'll post that example later. So here's the skewed PDF that I was talking about for this example. So I'll just give you the function. So the PDF looks like the following. Oops, there we go. So and doesn't want to cooperate. That's not good. Okay, so this thing is having a spaz attack. But let me uh, go on the board maybe and see if I can recover recover this example. So the PDF I'm going to draw or would have drawn on the board here on the marker on the electric board was So here is x, here's p of x. Okay, so the value up here it's two over nine, goes down all the way to three, zero. So this thing drops to probability zero over here outside this interval, has zero probability here, and here's the only place where it has non-zero probability. Okay, so here P of X has the following form. It's two over nine times three minus X times the indicator function that x is inside the interval zero to three. Okay, so if x is in that interval, it takes on this value if it's outside of zero. Okay, and I want f of x in this case to be, uh, let's see, this is two x squared minus three x plus one, and that function looks like the following. So if I draw the axes for f of x, I should get that you have a zero here, you have one, two, three. Okay, so you're gonna have something going from here all the way up like this. And this has values that take on, let's see, this is going to be a one, this is going to be three, and this is going to be 10. Okay, so where would you expect let's say the mean of this particular PDF to lie. Say again? At one, okay. Why do you say one? So the centroid of the right triangle, right? So you computed this and found that that was a centroid? Well, like a right triangle has a centroid of h over three, right? Okay, very good. That's a good fact to use. Okay, so that's exactly where the centroid is, right? So where is the, what is the expected value of this function going to be though? Also one, as it turns out. But, you know, this function is all the way warped up here. Why is the expected value going to be one? Well, it's because the probability mass of this function is mostly on this side of the curve, right? So even though you have gigantic values all the way out here, the fact that most of the probability mass lies that way is actually going to drive the expected value of this function down to around here. So you can actually do this. You can go home and compute this integral for yourself. And you can use the linearity of the expectation operator to, to prove these things, okay? To show that this is in fact what should end up happening, okay? So unfortunately, I think my pen might still be dead. Yeah, still dead. 
but I can flip through forward to uh, maybe the last few slides, or maybe I'll take a question instead. Yeah. Is the density function still valid if the area isn't one? So this area should be one because I've normalized it with this guy. Okay. Two thirds in the way. Two thirds. Two -thirds? Let's see. Equals zero. It's uh, three times two. Two times two. So, so keep in mind the integral of this thing, right? <laughs> Just the value labeled on the y-axis should just be two thirds. Two thirds? Okay. Yeah, but the function yeah, right. so function's can, fine. Okay. So that should be two thirds. That's right. Okay. But the normalizing yeah. constant, I think, is two ninths, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So you can find this from this condition, right? So you can find out what that ought to be. Okay. Okay. So I think uh, because this thing is broken, and I was going to write out a bunch of formulas, we'll skip. We'll stop here, and we'll talk about the normal distribution next time, and we'll talk about uh, other features of that. So